It's good to be here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see your faces again. Thank you for coming here this Sunday morning to hear from the word of God. Oh, Sundays are my favorite because we get to come together as one and learn from God. You know, during the week, I get, I get smacked a lot by God, you know. He teaches me a lot. I get to walk in that presence every day. And Sundays, we get to come together. Maybe we've been struggling a little bit, so now we have people to lean on to say, this is what we're struggling with. All right, to share the good things, too. This is the good things. Look, look what God's doing in my life. Because I know when I'm going through periods of struggle and I go to church and people are being blessed, I'm like, mine's coming soon. Right? It's encouraging. God's going to take care of me. Right? If he's taking care of you guys, he's going to take care of me. If he's taking care of me, he loves us all the same. And sometimes we go through things for our, us to grow. And that's wonderful, too. Sometimes I tell people when they say, I'm struggling, I'm like, good, 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 good. You know, if the enemy is messing with you, that means you're in the right place. Because he doesn't want us together, so he's going to do whatever he can to keep us apart. So if you're going through struggles, that's great. Right? We're going to talk about one of the epistles of Ephesians 1, Paul today. Paul, he says that all the time. You know, suffering. Right? To die is gain. He talks about suffering a lot. He suffered a lot. If you follow his life, he was shipwrecked. He was, he was laughed at. He was mocked. He was killing Christians, and he turned to loving Christians. So imagine what that was like. Imagine when he's showing up. Like, I'm going to give you the word. People are like, eh, it's a trap. You're going to kill us, right? So Ephesians 1, I'm going to read the first chapter. And Ephesians is known as an epistle, and that's a fancy word for, for a letter. It was a letter he wrote to the church. And Paul would write to churches not only to encourage them, but sometimes to chastise them. Because sometimes they're doing the wrong thing. Or they forget what their purpose was. Or, or why they came to Christ in the first place. And that's what my message is going to be based on today. It's, going to be, it's about walking in authority and what that looks like. In Ephesians, we can learn three things in Ephesians to know that how we can walk in authority. How do we do that? Right? Because when we're called... We're given a purpose. We're given a plan. Right? And we're given authority. From the very beginning, Genesis 1, he gave us authority. He made man and woman to look over the earth. And that's still the mission for, for us today, to look over the earth, look over every living thing, to be in charge, to have authority. So I'm going to pray before I begin to the word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sunday, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for calling all of us today, Lord. We're all here for purpose, on purpose, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to learn. Sit with us today. Speak with us. Don't let the devil have any foothold in any of this. He can't whisper to any of us, Lord. Let it be your spirit. And let us get what you want us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Ephesians 1, verse 11. We're going to start at verse 11. It says, In him we are chosen, having been predestined according to his plan. Awesome. According to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. 13. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance with the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the to the praise of his glory. So my first point is we were chosen. So to know that you can walk into authority, you have to know that you are chosen. It says here we are marked with a seal. So when you accept Christ into your heart, when you do the salvation prayer, you're sealed. That is your promise. We're chosen. It says predestined. And that's a, that's a whole different conversation. People talk about predestination. And I think he chose, he chooses everybody. He chooses everybody. When Christ died, he died for everybody. He knew that there was going to be people who weren't going to choose him. All right? And we're so hesitant in our walks to to share Christ because we're afraid that they might not accept it. 
But if we are to be like Christ, we're supposed to love them anyway. We're supposed to serve them anyway. He died for them anyway. He knew it. How, how hard is it for us to love somebody that we know is difficult? Yeah. Let's be honest. There's some people I'd rather talk to because I know they're going to give me a good response. Like, let me talk to these people over here. They already like me. These people throw me up. And you know what Jesus did? He died for them. Yeah. So what is, our, what is our job? To love them anyway. We need more feet washers in this world. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of people who are judging, but we don't have a lot of people that want to wash feet. When you wash feet, it's gross, it's dirty. Feet go through a lot. They sweat, they're in shoes all day. That's, that's what our calling is. Right? We are chosen. So here in verse 13, it says, You were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The word of truth, this word. He, when he left, he had this book put together for us to have now. Way back then, he had a plan. Way back in Genesis, he had a plan. The word was with God. In John, it says that the word was with God. He had this from the very beginning, knowing that we are going to be born into this wretched world of sin and that it was going to be hard. He gave us the instructions of how to do it. And oftentimes we forget that we have that authority and that power. Because if you wake up and you turn on the news, all you get is the negatives. All people like to do is negative. They like to complain. We like to complain. If I'm being honest, my first thought sometimes in the morning is, ah, oh, man, I gotta go to work. Like, you know, I'm not happy about the hell. Like, why? Why? And I start yelling at Adam and Eve. It's your fault. All right, you guys ate the apple. Now nah, I gotta work. All right? My first thought isn't always, thank you, God. But if you woke up this morning, it's thank you, God. Yeah. You still have a purpose. You still have the authority. And we like to, we, we like to say things like, and we quote the verse that death and life is in the power of the tongue, in Proverbs 18. But we say so many negative things. We're arguing all the time. I see arguments happening all the time. How are you loving people if you're arguing with them? How's that love? We are chosen. Let's read on verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Let me stop there. So the reason why we get bogged down is because we're not tuning in to God. It says to renew your mind every day. So every day, you should be on your knees when you wake up. Right when you wake up, asking God to give you the thoughts that you need to have, asking God to bring the people you need to speak with. Because there might be somebody that needs you that day. And if you're stuck worrying about your problems, instead of giving them to God, you cannot help the next person. If you are stuck in your own mindset, you're not allowing the Spirit to renew you. You're not, he renews you every day. He gives you a fresh cup every day. And sometimes, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I run with that cup from Sunday. And by Wednesday, I'm forgetting what the message was about. You know, I need a re-renewal. Re and I always forget. And when, when I always remember when I'm, when I'm on my way to work, or when, when I get to work, I'm at my desk, and I'm, and I'm angry, and I'm like, ah, I didn't pray. And I give it to God, and guess what? It's lifted, because now I told him. He knows everything, but he needs to hear it sometimes. Like, we know when our kids know the right thing, but sometimes we, we ask them questions, right, to see if they are hearing what we talk them. Like, hey, what do we do when, uh, before dinner? We wash our hands. Good. That's what he needs from us. That's how the relationship is supposed to work with us and the Lord. It's us talking to him. Here's what we need. Here's what we need to do. How can I do this? Everything. You need him every moment, every second of the day. Every second. And we forget that. Right? I struggle with anger. I used to struggle with anger. It's not a thing anymore. Right? So I had to get to the point where in the moment of me being angry, I had to tell the Lord to take it. Because if it went any longer, I was going to say something that I regret. Because I always regret when I gave someone attitude. I always regret when I went off. I thought about it later. Like, I'm such an idiot. I look dumb. 
right? So in the moment, I had to say, Lord, take this. Lord, let your peace sit upon me. And that's how sometimes renewing your mind works. You have to catch it right when it's happening. Because we get so used to thinking this way, we think it's normal. That's how our brains work. Our brains are just wired certain ways. If you're thinking that way for so long, guess what your mind's going to go to? I was used to getting angry. You know, I was raised in a household where there was anger, so I thought it was normal until I realized I looked foolish, right? And I, I was hurting people that I loved with my words, and sometimes with my actions. And sometimes there'll be something little that I'm being told, and I'm flying off the handle. And they're like, wow, I didn't know that. And then it makes people not want to talk to you. So now they're not going to tell me when something's going on. And that's not being who he is or who he created me to be, right? So you are chosen and God has a plan. I like to hear Paul said that every day he gives thanks for everybody uh, hearing God's plan. He gives thanks for that. And I'm thankful that I'm not the only one that he called because occasionally he speaks through me through other people. Right? Occasionally he sends somebody just send me an encouraging message. Right? He doesn't have to do that. They don't have to know. And half the time they don't know what I'm going through. And they'll send me something that's exactly what I'm going through. So that's where Paul was for the Ephesians. Paul was that person. They probably didn't, they were going through church every week. They didn't know that anything was going on. And then they get this letter and they're like, they're probably wondering, how does he know what's going on here? Right? How does he know we're not doing things right? How do we how does he know what kind of people we have in our church? Because once you're one in the spirit, you know everything. He's, he reveals things to you. You start knowing everything. You start feeling things. There's a spirit of discernment that gets unlocked. And later in Ephesians 4, it talks about the unity of people. Everybody is a oneness. Everybody's together. Everybody that calls on the name of the Lord is the same. And we spend so many hours. I've seen people spend so many hours arguing about how to believe in this word. When nowhere in here it says some people believe this way and some people believe the other way. I don't ever read that. But we get caught up on words. We get caught up on language. We get caught up on feelings. We get caught up on calling. We get so caught up on who's called to do what when we're all called to have a great relation with the Father. Amen. We're all called to have a great relation with each other. That's the calling. If you're doing that, you're great. There's no people try to push you to further things. I will encourage you that you're probably meant to do more than what you're doing. I will encourage that. But we're not supposed to just look for the high praise, for the high titles. I don't want a title. I want to sit in the back and watch the toilets. Right? That's just leave me alone. You don't see you see the church is clean? That was me. You know, you don't have to know. That's all I want to do. And he kept calling me to be a preacher, calling me to be a pastor. And I kept running. Guess what? My life kept getting messy. Right? Even now, I'm praying, I'm like, God, give me something else. I don't like I don't like talking. I'm quiet. Right? I don't like this. But I do what he, I, I know one thing. Paul wasn't doing what he's supposed to do. Paul got shipwrecked. I know one thing. Jonah wasn't doing what he's supposed to do. He got swallowed by a big fish. That's not what I want for my life. I learned my lesson. Good thing he had the book written. They went through it so I can learn from them. Now I don't have to do it. We don't have to do it. But we pick, sometimes we pick struggle and we don't even know. We'll blame the enemy. We'll say, oh, the enemy's against us. But when you turn from God, God allows things to take over. Right? When the Israelites, back in the Old Testament, when they were choosing other gods, it says many times that he let them get taken over. He let, back in uh, Egypt, he let Pharaoh take over them. He let them. Is that what you want? Fine. He does that with us. He'll tell us to do one thing, we keep doing another thing. It's like, that's what you choose. Fine. He lets us choose. Because he's a good father. He'll give you what you want. And sometimes that's what we want. We may not act for these things. We may be acting for money. We might be acting for a better job. We might be acting for love. But when we're not acting in accordance, he's not going to give us those things. If you say you want money, and you say he wants you to bless your finances, but you're loving money, he'll give you everything you want. And at the end, guess what you're going to feel? You're going to feel empty. You can have the house. You can have the car. You can have the buildings, and you can still feel empty because it's not what he wants, but he'll give it to you. When people ask why do good things happen to bad people, 
is because he will give it over to the desires. But they're not going to eternity. It also says it's harder for a rich man to receive the kingdom of God. It's harder to, to talk to somebody that thinks they have it all. And all I know is Jesus Christ crucified. Verse 18. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory, inheritance in the saints. It's the riches of his glory is what we're supposed to be after. Amen. Whatever he wants from me is whatever I want. Amen. It's whatever I need. And sometimes those lessons come a little hard. Sometimes I don't realize what I have, right? Because I think God will, he works in mysterious ways and he will reveal things to you in part because he needs you to work on things. So I will see something and I think I'm supposed to be doing it and wonder why there's no growth. And that's where you forget. That's where you forget, you get stuck. So now it's like, okay, well maybe this is all that he wants from me. Maybe this is who I am. Maybe this is all I can do. Maybe I can't handle anymore, right? There's all these can'ts, but in my Bible, I see all these can'ts. It's like, here's what you can do. Here's what you do. Here's the job. And Paul reminded the Ephesians here in 17, he says, I keep asking that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, that the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So when we're seeking our own understanding and we're going day by day on our own we're not going to find we're not going to be revealed anything god's not going to tell us anything he we have to ask him all right god what do you need me to do today what is my job today Amen. and maybe your job is just to be a good employee maybe your job is to be a good mom a good father a good employee that's your job for the day and in honoring that you're honoring him Amen. sometimes he doesn't ask for that but at the same time, he can bring you from glory to glory. So if you're asked to preach at a church that's not yours, you go do it. Right? I don't know how I got time. Right? But I know I love this church. And you guys are on my heart. And I look at the other speakers that have been here. I know Dan Hope. I know those guys. Right? Courtney from, from our church. It's like, oh, look at those are great people. Jeremy, you want to preach there? I guess so, right? He qualifies the call. I don't think I was qualified to be a pastor, right? If it was up to me, no, I'm not gonna be a pastor, right? But I've already had that conversation with God many times. And every time where I went away from the plan, things were stagnant. I even like, okay, I can be a youth pastor, right? Right, so I'm being a youth pastor, and even with that, they said, youth are not growing, they're not receiving Christ. I'm like, what am, not, what am I doing wrong? It's because it's not where I'm supposed to be. I'm not the right person for that job. Our church gets a youth pastor. The youth start growing. They start preaching. We got our Wednesday night service. We allow, um, you know, other people who are up and coming pastors to speak. And we've had three of our youth preach messages. And not only did they preach messages, they spoke into our lives. So I wasn't the right guy. God cannot work if it's wrong, right? He cannot, he doesn't work out of order. He has an order. If you're not with him, it's not going to work. It's kind of like if you are if you work on cars and you go to work on a boat, you're probably not going to do it right. The boat was very different. You're not going to ask uh, an auto mechanic to fix a plane, right? It's the same when we're working in our spirits and in our fruits, and the fruits of our spirits. We all have our gifts. And if you're not working your gifts, it's not gonna grow. It'll be good, and it will sound good. I know some of you guys have been to churches where it sounds good, but you don't feel like you belong there, right? You don't feel the love of God. It sounds great, but there's no outreach. It sounds good, but people don't hang out during the week. If you read Acts 2, the Acts 2 church, everybody did everything together. And everybody gave what they had. Everybody, it was even. If you need something, I have it. You, it's yours. Right? That's what we should strive for. And that's when we're finding our gifts and our purpose. When everything's working in cohesion, that's where you see growth. That's where you see love. Right? That's where you see the Holy Spirit. That's where he's dwelling. 
And let me encourage this. I feel the Spirit in this church. I feel the Spirit in this world. I know everybody in here loves the Lord. And you can feel that. And you can feel the presence of God when you're in a place like that. I know some of you have walked in places, and it says it's a church, but it's like, this doesn't feel like church. And it's more than you just being a new person. Right? That's the Holy Spirit working in you, telling you something's wrong. And instead of running from that, what we're good at, we're, we run from when we don't see certain things because we get stuck in glory. And glory in us is the numbers, how many people are in the church, how, how fancy are their equipment. Like we see that stuff and we think, oh, if we don't have that, we must not be blessed. When all that matters is, are they teaching the truth? Are they speaking from the Bible? When I go, I want to hear the Bible. If I don't hear the Bible, they don't open the Bible, I am not going to stick around. If I see the pastor, and the pastor is having all, all the cars and all the money and the people, his people are suffering, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run. That's not the place. We're supposed to come up along each other. That's our God. So remember, when you walk in authority, that you are chosen and God has a plan. It's verse 19. And in his incomparably great power for us, we, for us who believe, that power is like the work, I'm sorry, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. For above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. So third point, we have authority. God has given us authority. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed Christ over everything in the church. Let's, start, let's, let's read 19. Let's go over this right here. It says, In his incomparably great power for us, we believe that power is like working of his mighty strength. So we have authority. We have authority because we have his power. Amen. We have his power when we accept it. It comes into us. So we have authority over all things. And we like to walk around and, and we doubt ourselves and, and we're afraid to tell people about the gospel, what he does for us, right? We serve the king who took the keys of life from the devil. He went in and overcame and came back to life. And we think we're insignificant. The power that raised him from the dead is the same power that's in us. And we think we're not good enough. We think we can't teach. We think we can't tell somebody about the gospel, what he did for us on that day. We get scared. But he took the keys. Of he was in hell. Right? He, was in the, he was with the devil. And he said, I'm not staying here. This isn't my home. Right? And that's the power we have. So we can come out of bondage. We can overcome depression. We can overcome anxiety. We can help other people overcome depression and anxiety. We have that power. And demons tremble at his name. You say Jesus. Say Jesus. That's it. We have that power. We have that authority. And we forget. We get caught up in, in the gold and the glory and the girls, the three G's. We get caught up in that stuff, or the guys. Right? When it's simple, we focus on him, we ask him to come into our lives. And we're able to do anything. We're able to do anything. We got people in this church suffering. They're suffering from cancer. They could overcome that. Right? We got people suffering with financial struggles. I think we're all in it. You know, everybody's being touched a little bit financially, right? We could overcome that. We serve the master that 
has everything, that knows everything, that sets things before us. He knew that we were going to be in this situation. He knew the country was going to be in this state. He knew it beforehand. You don't think he has a way out? Right? He had a way out from the beginning. He sent Jesus as the way out. We were all destined to hell. We are all destined for nothing but pain and suffering. And he sent Jesus. He came down in the form of a man. Human man. So think to put that in perspective. He was human. There was nothing special except that he was the actual son of God. He felt pain. He had to learn. He got yelled at by his parents too. You see when he ran away and he was in the temple. Our kids like to run away and get lost and do their own thing sometimes. So Jesus, that was Jesus. Jesus was a 12 year old boy. My son, my kids are 12. I got 12 year olds. He was like that. He had to be chastised. Even Jesus, he felt that. Before he went on the cross, what did he do? What, what kind of feelings did he have? He didn't want to. He was like, Lord, if there's anything else, please, if there's anything else, let me do that instead. So he had very human emotions. How many of us have that? How, how many of us are feeling called by, by Jesus to do something? And we think, well, maybe somebody else should do it because I can't. Our Lord felt the same way. Before he died on the cross, he felt the same way. He was like, there has to be something else. There's something else I can do, right? Like I'm, I'm a very introvert by a person. And when God said, you're gonna, be, you're gonna preach, I was like, there has to be something else. There's no way you're gonna pick me. The quietest one. I, I'm one out of, out of nine. And I, if I tell you all eight of my siblings are all loud and outgoing, and I'm the one that's not, Right? How does that work? My, my brother was a worship pastor. Made sense. Very loud. Very musically inclined. And like, me pastor. Doesn't make sense. No one even knew I had a voice until two years ago. That's how quiet I was. So we used to have these youth services when I was a kid. Quiet as one in the youth group. And they were saying, they, they had the idea to let youth, you know, run the service. Even youth speak. I got picked unanimously by all the kids in the class. And I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? I don't speak, right? So I've been called for a very young age. And I know there's people in here that are called to do great things. Because if he could call me and he could use me, he could use anybody. I don't have any special traits except that I love Jesus. And that's all you need. Love Jesus, rely on him for everything. Ask him to build your grocery list. That's how you get used to talking to them, just talk to them. It's kind of like, you know, people used to have diaries, dear diary, dear Jesus, here's what I'm going through. What can I do? Wake up in the morning, dear Jesus, before you take a step, dear Jesus, what should I do today? And he'll tell you, he'll tell you. And remember, that we have authority. Remember we were chosen, God has the plan, we have authority. He has a plan. And we can rest on his plan. Mm -hmm. That no matter what it looks like, he's going to get us through it. Amen. No matter what we feel like, he doesn't go based on our feelings, by the way. No matter how we feel, he's going to get us through it. Remember, it says to choose joy. So even if your life is in turmoil, choose joy. And I can tell you that blessings come from that. Amen. So I have my family with me today. My, my two sons, I got Nehemiah, Josiah, and my daughter Gabriella. So I have a prophet and a king and, and an angel everywhere I go, right? So nine months, nine months we were without a home. We were going place to place, uh, sleeping in the church, nine months. And can I tell you through all that, there wasn't a plan. Uh, I didn't have a plan, right? There wasn't a plan. I didn't know what was gonna happen the next moment. I was doing things that were right. We have credit scores. We should be able to get a house. We have good credit, right? We've had, we've had money. We've had everything. All the, all the things we have are right. We were trying to rent. We were, we were told that we had too many people for things we were renting, like, you know, it wasn't making sense. And we were just being denied over and over for who knows what. We probably looked at over 60 homes I didn't know what was going on next. So 
the problem we had in our in our home that we were renting, the the pipes blew, and it was like a problem that over years. So it was more than the, the sewage was literally coming through the heater vents. Like you could hear the water rushing. So the house got condemned, right? So let me tell you what God had in order for our family. So not only were we given a home, so this home was out of our price range, right? And the Lord's like, go for it. And I prayed for every house before I made an offer. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to move on my own. Because that's how we got into situation in the first place. We really wanted the place we were at before, and it wasn't really a good fit, but we were trying to make it work for a couple years, and we had problem after problem in that house. So I make an offer to this house, and not only was it an offer, it was an offer that was really, really low, right? So I'm like, Lord, I don't know, you're telling me to, to go low. And I put in the low offer, within hours, we got, it, we got approved. And not only, so this house has updated plumbing, so we don't have to worry about the same issue that we had. And if we do, it has a system where you can just pull the valves on all the pipes and they're, they're opened. So the problem with our last house is you had to crawl into this tiny little hole to get to the pipes of the house. So it was making it impossible. So we kept having these plumbers come and giving us quick fixes because you know the root of the problem was deep into the ground, right, pretty much. So now we have a house where we don't have to have anxiety over that. And we're trying to run um, a couple of businesses so I can be more open with my time to be with people, to serve people when I do pastor. I want to have that flexibility. And with a normal job, you just don't have that. So everybody comes and we have this big three-door garage now. And they start naming all the businesses that we can run out of there. And we've had these talks, just me and my wife. So they're naming businesses that we're thinking of already. And they're like, in the house, in the garage has electric. Right, and it already and it has it has plumbing, it has everything in the garage, and we didn't ask for. We just wanted a home. We're like we got to the point where we're like God, just let us have somewhere we can have our stuff and be at peace. And God did more than what we asked for Amen. because He had that plan all along. And the reason why it took so long is because we were viewing things wrong. We were viewing how we handled money wrong. We were viewing how we were thinking that. Maybe there's some hidden sin, and why we're, that's why we're going through this. And it was very much like Job. We had people telling you, well, maybe you need to pray more. Maybe this is going on. And we were like, well, maybe that's true. And that wasn't it at all. When I was praying to the Lord at that time, he would say, you're exactly where I need you to be. And that confused me. I'm like, this is where you want me to be? Right? So I had, I had back and forth with the Lord. And then I, I had a moment where I thought, like, maybe... I'm not supposed to be following you, Lord. Maybe I, I always mess up. So I don't know why you keep calling me. And then in the midst of this, I'm going to ministry school through the Assemblies of God. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to run a church if I can't even run my house. Right? So he had the plan from the beginning. He knew this house was sitting there. That house that we got was sitting on the market untouched for 96 days, waiting for us to look at it. And it's a neighborhood where I wanted to look. And I'm like, ah, I can't afford to live in that neighborhood. No, I didn't look. We had to, then they came to us, that was the last house we, we looked at. And I was like, I'm like, you know, probably gonna get denied, but let's let's put this offer in within hours. And it's a house that not only that is a place for us to live, that's all we were looking for at that point. Because we were living in hotel rooms, we're all in little Airbnbs on top of each other. And now my kids can sit in their room. And I can sit in mine, and I don't hear them, and it's nice. I have to go check on them, make sure they're alive, instead of just hearing them argue. So I'm hearing Dad. I'm like, oh, you guys okay in there? It's nice. And we've, we've had people out the house. That's all I've wanted. So before, he had to change my heart, because before, I didn't want people in my house. I was keeping people away. I had walls up. I had trust issues. And through the nine months, I was forced to trust people. I was forced to ask for help, because I had no, I don't know what to do. So he had to change my heart. And sometimes he makes it very, very, he likes to make a big deal, right? Like, I always pray for people. Sometimes, I've, had, I've known people that came to Christ after car accidents. Sometimes he has to flip a car to catch your attention. Sometimes he has to set your house on fire to get your attention. He's a jealous guy. So if you're going to other things, he's going to make it known. And that's what he had to do in my life. I, I didn't, I was like, 
I was called to be a pastor a long time, but I'm like, I don't even like people. I don't like talking. It's not going to work. And he put me in a situation where now, like, I want everybody to see what the Lord has done. So I'm like, come to my house. Look what he gave us. Look what's going on. Everybody comes to you. And it's not just for me. So now I know when other people are in this situation, I have room in my house, in my garage, for people to stay long term because there's plumbing in there. That's what God did. God they gave us way more than what we're asked for. We got to point this, give us a home, Lord. We need a home. So let that be an encouragement to you guys that he knows what he's doing, even when it doesn't seem like life's going in that order. And that's why you guys have been heavily on my heart. Because there is there is a pastor somewhere. Made for Green New York. And it might be taking a little longer because that pastor has to be pruned. And he has to be right for this church. And when he shows up, she shows up, it's going to be powerful. It's going to be growth here like never seen before. There's going to be revival here like never before. I feel that in my spirit. I feel that when I pray for Green when the, for this congregation. It's going to be great. But keep praying, because that person is probably going through some stuff. And maybe they're going through some doubts. Keep praying. Keep praying for each other. Keep loving each other. And we pray us out. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this congregation, Lord. I pray that your spirit rests upon them each and every day, Lord. I pray that you keep the enemy and anything they're trying to do against them, through them, around them. I pray that they all, they all cease this, Lord, and that they hear from you and only you, and that you are able to grow them to be the people that you want them to be. In Jesus' name, amen.